here is Paul Thomas Anderson talking to Alex Godfrey. Do please enjoy. Paul Thomas Anderson, welcome to the Empire Podcast. Ah, thank you. <laughs> hey, there you go. Um, is it weird having people call you by your full name and middle name every time? You know, yeah, I mean, it was at first. I think I'm just used to it now. It's so, but it, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah, it is. I, I, now it's, um, I'm used to it, but every once in a while it just rings so odd. Um, can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, can you imagine somebody calling you by your full Um no, I can't. It would be really. Does anyone in your life outside of work call you Paul Thomas Anderson? <laughs> no, my kids do as a joke. <laughs> you know, like... As we speak, you're in London. Um, we're not in the same room. Have you? I imagine you haven't. But have you, or would you want to go and revisit the Phantom Thread house? I drove through um, or around Fitzroy Square just yesterday when I came in. Hmm. And I got very tingly and excited and, and melancholy and, and kind of rush with, with, you know, um, memory. Um, I don't need to go back inside the house. I mean, that would be nice, I suppose, but uh, yeah, even if I just sort of cruise by and, and look outside, there could be something nice about it, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It was, I don't know if, if it's empty or if somebody bought it or, or, or who's in it now, but, um, mm. I have, you know, that I have so many incredible memories of my time here um, doing that film. Yeah. But really, the memories are actually more attached, you know, funny enough to, to the streets of Soho, where we'd we'd walk back from shooting every night and walk to Technicolor and watch dailies. And so, yeah. and every time I come here, I have such great memories. It's it's strange going there. I mean, obviously, I didn't have the experience you did. I didn't. I didn't make the film, but you you can, I have been past it a couple of times and it's weird to just sort of to stand and acknowledge it. And you can, you can just imagine Reynolds Woodcock just still being there. It's almost like it's haunted by him. I, I mean, I, I mean, it could end up happening. I'm, I've got enough time where I could see it, it happening. Um, <laughs> does it look empty or does it, does it look like somebody's in it? I, I mean, who knows with those houses? I think, I think I saw it was up for sale, but I mean, right. there's got to yeah. be something going on. I hope it's not empty. That would be a shame. It was owned by a woman who owned a, who seemed to have, uh, she owned a clothing line that I can't remember the name of. When we first spoke for Licorice Pizza uh, back in October, uh, it, I don't even think it was 100% finished back then. And so this stage of things was all new to you. And obviously you had no idea how people would respond to it and receive it. Uh, what's it been like over the past three or four months then having it out in the world and having it being so loved and so lauded, what's that been like for you? It's been great. It was, it was a, but it was a very, um, you know, it was a very um, explosive and then quiet. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that at least in the States, I mean, we came, we came, you know, we early November, we think we started showing the film and, and it was so thrilling and so exciting, but you know, the next thing, you know, we turned around by the, the time of you know a month later all this enthusiasm and energy that we had in terms of releasing the movie wide across the states was it got quiet again you know when omicron came around and mm. and 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 um so it was it was a classic example of like enjoy you know and i still have I've, i get reminded of this all the time you know you go through all this work and you do it and you, you can maybe count on your hands um both both of them the the screenings that really matter that are so special that are you know the first couple that you do or, yeah you know first time you sort of bring it over here it was so exciting and those memories are with me for a long time and then yeah it was weird but the fun thing is it's been out for so long which is the kind of was the goal i mean we played in theaters for 13 weeks which is sort of unheard of yeah um without being without being on a computer screen um, and that'll happen sometime in March, you know, for most places, but that, that's been a, that's felt like a successful, um, achievement in this mm. day and age that so many people, you know, initially going to see the film, but then I guess slowly, slowly coming to discover it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been really good. It's been great. It feels like it's the emotional impact of the film and the vibe of it all, the warmth and the sweetness seems to be something that's 
I think people have latched onto and it's so welcome right now. It's such a sweet film. And I th- correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you're in the midst of writing something else before this one sort of took over your consciousness. Mm-hmm. What was going on that made you veer towards this sort of the tone, the sweetness and the sort of innocence of this film? Was there something that was going on that made you go into that sort of territory? Well, I'm reluctant to sound like this kind of person, but I don't know if you remember a few years ago, um, there was this guy who was president of the United States. <laughs> and it was a really, it was really horrible. Mm. So every day was, every day was shit. Every day sucked. Every day was chaos. And yeah. Um, so um, maybe the only way around it was to just sort of lock yourself in your room and, and make believe and flashback or, you know, go back to another time where, um, you know, yeah, somehow anybody in their memory, every, anybody sort of the time that you grow up in is somehow very romantic. Yeah. Right. Um, mm-hmm. You can't imagine that anything bad would have happened at that time ever, you know, <laughs> which yeah. of course is entirely inaccurate, but, um, but shit, I don't know in this day and age, um, as complicated as things might've been in the seventies and shitty as they were, mm it all seems positively quaint right now. Yeah. You know, especially today uh, exactly. we, we speak as war breaks out around us. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I guess I'm one of those dummies, those liberal dummies who mm-hmm. is still surprised. Yeah. You know, I'm still surprised. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, most friends I have with more common sense look at me and go, what did you think? What did you, you think everything was good, was fine? I think, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those dummies that wakes up every morning thinking everything's going to be okay. And, I, yeah. there's a, and yet here we are. Yeah, crazy day. Crazy yeah. day to be talking about. Um, no. Yeah. I would hope um, many people listening to this have seen the film, but um, obviously, as you say, people are still discovering it, which is great. And going back to see it again, I know. Um, yeah, there's a lot of that, which is really cool. Yeah, but just in case people haven't seen it, it's so just to sum up as quick as I can. It's a it's a wonderfully nostalgic romantic drama about um, well a young woman in her mid twenties, mm-hmm. played by Alana Haim, starting up a relationship of sorts with this peculiarly confident fifteen year old guy, uh, played by Cooper Hoffman. Um, much of it was inspired by the real life nineteen seventies escapades of your friend now producer Gary Getzman. That's right. And I know, as you've told me before, the germ that came from you seeing this kid come onto the, a photographer's assistant at a school photo day. Yeah. Uh, there you go. I've saved you a lot of bother there. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what I want to ask is, as you were grabbing together all of these episodes and elements, some of which you were party to and many of which you weren't, mm-hmm. um, so you were melding them together, but then what is completely yours I, I guess, is the incredibly warm, sometimes confounding, but enormously good-hearted relationship at the heart of the mm-hmm. film that drives the whole film. Can you talk about what you wanted to do there? Is there something you had in mind or was it an organic evolution of just hanging hanging out with these characters? Is there something you were going for in terms of the relationship? And can we talk about... Um, how you sort of went about that and this parade of shitty men that Alana has to navigate to, to, to get to where she wants to be, even though she doesn't might, you might not know where she wants to be. Well, you know, I think to assume that I had some kind of plan gives me too much credit. Right. I know. I mean, which I like, I like my experience has been, and particularly on this one is that you, there's a strong a premise that you have and you write and you, you just keep asking yourself, well, what would really happen next? Well, what would really happen next? You know, um, mm. so um, once the first sort of, for lack of a better word, episode had happened, I felt like I understood what was going on. And what I mean by that is I had these two characters meet. You have Alana mm-hmm. and Gary meet. Um, he's too young for her. She's too old for him. But there's some kind of connection. Their banter really works, right? Um, and yeah. there's... And, but what happens next? Well, she's got a gig as his chaperone mm-hmm. in New York. And what's going to happen next? Well, she's got stars in her eyes for one of his co-stars. That was maybe clearly a little bit more her age. Right. Mm-hmm. So she ditches, you know, she, she ditches, uh, ditches the, the young kid for the, for the better target, which is this handsome young actor um, kind of dicky character. 
Um, he soon reveals his true colors. Mm -hmm. And we have, and by this time we're at page, let's say 20 or 25. And right. once, once you've written that, a story's kind of emerged, you mm -hmm. know, and you think, right, this looks pretty good. This looks, this looks exactly right. Um, and then you just keep following it. What happens next? You know, what happens next is they go their own separate ways and then they meet back up again. Yeah. And there's another challenge and then there's another challenge. So you kind of emerge, what emerges as a theme you kind of hold on to is these, um, these side routes that she takes in her life mm -hmm. um, that generally seem to emerge as the same thing uh, in different, in different clothes. You know, here's, here's my dalliance with a 60 something year old aging movie Lothario, who's going to try to seduce me in a, you know, red leather booth restaurant with martinis and all that kind of stuff. But really, in fact, he's actually just wants to do lines from his movies and yeah. wants nothing to do. He isn't even talking to me, you know, yeah. <laughs> Um, but all the way through the kind of the misread signals and the realities, the harsher realities of, of, a, of a potential romance with what turns out to be a gay man who's having to hide his sexuality yeah. uh, at a time when, you know, letting that emerge was, was impossible. Mm. Um, so yeah. Um, that, there you have it. Um, yeah. You just, I don't know when you're writing a story, I think you're always just, you 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 have you just keep asking yourself like well what would happen what would really happen you know mm. well i tell you what i know exactly what's going to happen is that she's going to start flirting with that guy and she's going to she's off you know that's how she's that's how that's going to go mm. and he's going to he's going to keep flirting with her but the second he's got somebody his own age that that sort of rumbles around he's going to lose her and pretend that it's his babysitter and you know on and on and on yeah well and one of the people she comes into well, they both come into contact with is John Peters, the right infamous producer of uh, <laughs> Tim Burton's Batman, which of Eastwick, and he's a real wild man. Uh, I guess he was in life, and certainly in this film. Um, is it right? No, Bradley Cooper plays him astonishingly. Um, he's kind of hilariously terrifying. Is it right? Was was that the first thing you shot for the film? Is that have I got that right? That's right. Um... Which was great because it, it's like jumping into the deep end of a very dark and freezing cold pool. It's a shock to the system to get started that way. Normally you try and start a film if you have any kind of ability to start with something kind of, you know, a little lightweight the first day. It's a, it's a, it's a good, you know, good way to start. But we jumped right into the, the, the deep end of the pool yeah. um, because of scheduling because Bradley had to go back to do Nightmare Alley. You know, he had, he, they'd shut down Nightmare Alley because of COVID. And mm. so he grew his hair and grew a beard during COVID and we shot him up first and then he shaved and went back, but it was a great way to start for multiple reasons. Um, not the least of which was that it, 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 it put, you know, Alana and Cooper, these two amateur actors in, in, in quite the bonding experience because they were having to survive the yeah full blown beratement of, you know, yeah. <laughs> Bradley Cooper, the, meters. the onslaught. Um, so, so yeah, both of them hadn't acted before. You would not know it from seeing this film. Um, they're both incredibly natural and incredibly powerful performances. I think you told me that the only acting Cooper had ever done before was home movies with you. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. You're making me think, so, you know, you know it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of alternately melancholy, but quite proud. You know, there's only, it's uh you only you're a virgin once, right? You know, so uh, it's incredible because you, you you this is that this is it. This is the first performances they'll yeah they've ever given, and and I'm pr and I'm proud that that's what it's what's going to be because it's there was there used to be a kind of um there must be a phrase for it, but I remember hearing some people speak about um, second season sitcom acting mm -hmm. and, and and the curse was is that you had all these fresh-faced young actors who would, would get the their 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 start on the first season of a sitcom and the sitcom would become a huge hit and you'd come back for season two and everyone would look look like complete you know be completely made up all the all the kind of innocence and magic of 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 what had happened had now been completely erased with like um you know airbrushing and 
yeah, an enormous amount of cash in their pockets and all this kind of stuff. And it was the appeal was gone, you know. What That's not gonna happen with them? <laughs> okay. Um, what were those home movies that you used to make with uh, with Cooper? Were, uh, were they were they fun well, and games? Well, hey, fun and games maybe maybe for you, but behind the scenes, they were there there were a lot of hard work. I right. mean, they, <laughs> I mean, we were. <laughs> We, um, anything that, you know, I particularly the last Mission Impossible Fallout, I think was the name of it, was the last one, right? With, mm. uh, that was, that was a huge inspiration for us. Um, <laughs> okay. a, a lot. Uh, I mean, I absolutely love that film. I think it's probably my favorite one in that whole series. Yeah, it's great. So we were really inspired by that. So there were a lot of hand-to-hand combat fight scenes, you know, so very similar to the, the one that happens in the stall of the bathroom. We would do a lot of that. There's a, um, where I live, not not far from where I live, there's an old um, a Nike missile site um, and it's still there. It's abandoned and it's this great Mission Impossible type location. So we would go up there and we would shoot my son, Jack, um, you know, mm. discovering a Cooper in his, his evil lair and then they would have a fight and eventually Cooper would be thrown off of the side of his evil lair to his death, like hundreds of feet below. Right. That kind of shit. <laughs> okay. I'd love to, would you, <laughs> would you put them on the Blu-ray? Yeah. They're going to have their own Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see them just to finish. You know, I was, I was frantically Googling this morning cause I, I had a thought hard eight, your wonderful first feature film was released in America 25 years ago, almost to the day. Wow. Wikipedia tells me it was February 28th. That sounds 19, right. Wow. 1997. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I hadn't, I didn't know it was that long. Obviously it, it was, but I get the impression you're not one to look back too much, but what do you think now sort of taking that in and sizing it all up and looking back to the young filmmaker who was just starting off and not knowing what was ahead of him? Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, already the memories are flooding back to me. I'm, I didn't, I barely even heard the last part of your question. Cause I started going down memory lane thinking mm. about that. Um, I, 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 yeah, I have these visions of being up in um, Berkeley, California because we were mixing boogie nights. Yeah. Um, because the, 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 the editing of the first film had been delayed and delayed and all kinds of things had gone wrong and on and on and on and it had dragged on. Mm. So I ended up being in this position by the time they'd released it in theaters and they released it in just a couple of like, handful of theaters. Yeah. But I happened to be in Berkeley mixing Boogie Nights when it came out. So it was the first opportunity that I ever had to go to see a film that I had made in, in a movie theater, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was in on University Avenue in B- Berkeley. And it looked good and it sounded good and it was exciting, but you know, there's like three people in the theater and it was sort of melancholy because that was kind of, that's was all, it wasn't given much attention or, or, um, you know, support. And, you know, it was a small film. It wasn't like it was going to light the box office on fire or anything like that, but um, it was a tremendously life saving feeling to be, to, to be working on something else at the time, you know, that that I kind of, um, I was able to learn that, the satisfaction um, of doing this work is, is, is not, it, it, there's, there's joy in being able to see it on a screen um, and, and see people respond to it. But um, the, the real part of it is, is, is already behind you at that point. Um, and luckily yeah. I didn't, I didn't, um, I had something else to be working on. So I didn't have that kind of the kind of fallout that I eventually did feel. I remember, Get, navigating the emotional kind of um, depression that can happen when you put something out, you put so much work into it and then mm. it's, it's all kind of over. Yeah. Um, it was very hard for many, many years. That's something they never really warn you against. Mm. Um, it's just how, you know, heavy duty it can kind of weigh on you to work really hard on something and then put it out. And even if people love it and they're excited by it, you can get this great buzz and fulfillment from that but they're on to the next as well. And, and you're yeah. sort of stuck there holding an empty bag. Like, oh, what do I do next? That's, that's a hard thing to navigate as a young filmmaker. And that, that took me sure. many years. So, well, look, it's been amazing to see what you did do next and then next and then next and then next. It's been, look, it's, you've had a good 25 years and it's been great. It's, it's been great to, um, 
to watch everything you've done. And uh, this one particularly is, is fantastic. So um, congrats on, on all of it. And thank you so much for talking to us today. It was great. Long live empire. The, 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 the greatest of all film, film magazines for thank sure. You. It's very yeah. kind of you to say, thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right.